If you would like to earn CPE credit for listening to the show, visit earmarkcpe.com, download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. Now on to the show. From Data Rails, this is FPNA Today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FPNA Today. I am your host, Paul Barnhurst, aka the FPNA Guy, and you are listening to FPNA Today. FPNA Today is brought to you by Data Rails, financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Every week, we welcome a leader from the world of financial planning and analysis and discuss some of the biggest stories and challenges in the world of FPNA. We will be providing you with actionable advice about financial planning and analysis. This is going to be your go-to resource for everything FPNA. I'm thrilled to welcome today's guest on the show, Glenn Hopper. Glenn, welcome to the show. Hey, Paul. Thanks for having me. Yeah, super excited to have you. So let me just give a little bit of Glenn's background, and then I'll give him an opportunity to tell us a little bit more about himself. So he comes to us from the Memphis area. He has a master's in finance and business analytics from Harvard. He has worked for a number of different companies, primarily in finance roles, and has served as the CFO for several different companies. And he recently wrote a book called Deep Finance, Corporate Finance in the Information Age. So Glenn, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and you know how you kind of came to be a CFO and write a book about finance? Yeah, sure. Um, so I used to apologize about this. Uh, that I didn't come up, I didn't come to the CFO role in the traditional CPA, public accounting, audit, you know, the, the, the traditional CFO, CFO, CFO uh, <laughs> path. And, um, uh, you know, the more I've, the more I've been talking about it, the more I've been talking to others that, and, and especially an FBNA audience, I feel like I don't have to apologize for anything here because my, I came up through, um, initially, I mean, if we went way back in the Stone Age before I got into finance, I was a journalist in the Navy, um, which that's the weirdest transition going from Navy journalism to finance. But um, uh, when I got out of the Navy, I was uh, my first corporate role was I was a product manager. This is in the late 90s, early 2000s. I was a product manager for a uh, tool that built uh, it was think of WordPress, uh, but this was back in the late 90s. So, you know, very sure. few out there. So um, I, I started in marketing and um, my product, I always felt like didn't have enough budget dollars. And with my freshly minted MBA, I decided <laughs> that I was going to uh, uh, really push for, you know, let me look at the budget. Let's see if we can find some place for it. So long story short on that, I ended up becoming the budget guy for the sales and marketing group. And then after uh, a few rounds and, and meetings, the COO of the company said, I want that guy. And he brought me out of marketing into operations. So I was the, it was kind of a, a rev ops role. I was the, the budget guy for the chief operating officer, um, in the, in the company. And, from there, I went uh, and really cut my teeth on FPNA and early. This is early two thousand, still business analytics. And so, to me, um, I had the company's first business intelligence group, what because we were tracking all the metrics, not just the, the financial. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, the analytics and finance function have been joined at the hip for the, the entirety of my career. And with the, that was, I was in telecom back then and ended up, uh, moving to much smaller companies, but I got a bigger title and a lot more responsibility. And that was in maybe about 2007. I took my first CFO role and I've spent the past, uh, 15, 16 years going from one startup to another, um, as a CFO and kind of the, the timing when I come in would be right around the A round or when somebody, if they've bootstrapped, if they're looking to raise money or to, to be acquired or whatever, and they need to go, you know, that startup to scale up phase. And that's when I come in to um, help them sort of professionalize their back office and finance operations. Great. I appreciate that. And, you know, funny enough, when you mentioned Navy, that's where I started my career. I was civilian, but I worked for the Navy on a Navy base for four years. If you've heard of China Lake. Okay. So I spent four, I spent four years out of China Lake and you know, another kind of interesting note, you mentioned not many people see finance from, you know, background journalism, the Navy, the guy I have on next week, which is a fractional CFO, my next interview, he uh, started his career with the Navy. He was a power plant, nuclear power plant supervisor. And now he's a so fractional CFO. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, you do get him occasionally. I mean, what's the chances of the back to back interview? So when you said that, it just kind of, you know, stuck out to me of, wow, there's some, you know, uh, coincidence there. 
But uh, so yeah, definitely a different background. I really like how you talked about how, you know, business and analytics, it's kind of always been together, you know, in finance, right? The finance and analytics side, similar for me and that I have a master of science information management. I started in a report writing and putting in a BI dashboard type role and then switched to fp and So I've always been closely tied to the you know, analytics side of the process. So I can appreciate that. So maybe next, can you tell us, you know, why did you decide to write a book? You know, I think it's uh, corporate finance in the information age. So how did that come about? Yeah, the uh, well, so the the desire to write, I think, comes from the journalism background. And it's sort of writing is the way that I sort of work through a problem. I mean, yeah, you can, you know, you can go through and, and try to come in to a place where you can solve an answer mathematically. But just to, while I'm thinking something, my approach to it is to write. So I've and once a journalist, always a journalist, maybe I can't, I'm, I'm compelled to keep writing blog posts and I'm an, a contributor for several different websites. And it's just, it's one, I'm kind of an evangelist for, uh, the, uh, for what I do with the automation and data collection and, uh, using machine learning and, and algorithms and, and really combining data science and, FP and A together uh, for modeling and for all the an analysis that we do and everything. And um, so, you know, for several years, I'd been writing all these blog posts and, and articles for various websites about um, using data science and finance. And I looked back and I thought, this is a lot of <laughs> a lot of content here. It's it, and it wouldn't take much to make it a cohesive single unit of work that would. Um, that would capture everything that, uh, that I've been talking about. And so the mission of the book is for people, whether they're new to finance or have been doing it a while, but I was picturing someone who'd been doing finance and accounting in a corporate setting for a long time and very good at that, very much a professional in that area. But we get stuck in the way that we do things and we're pretty good. All of us are pretty, are very good at Excel and we know how to do crazy stuff in Excel. And it's thinking about trying to do things a different way can be intimidating and trying to keep up with the latest accounting changes and what's going on, everything you have to measure there. And then, oh, by the way, learn this new technology. It sounds daunting. And why would I do that when what I've been doing works? So the the mission of the book was twofold. One, to make this new technology more accessible to break it down and just explain it at a, at a base level and two to show the power of it and well i guess the third part of it is i've got a big section of the book that is how to basically lead a digital transformation from the finance department for for an entire company okay so sounds like there's a few things in there you know what what it is why you should do it kind of how to think about it and then how to lead a transformation yes so maybe on, on that part, on the transformation, because most, you know, we, we've been hearing digital transformations in finance for a decade now. We hear a lot of them fail. You know, kind of what, what's your take? What advice do you offer to someone in leading a transformation? How do you think about that? So first off, I, 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 I just said digital transformation, but I've, I've been kind of called on the carpet for that for the exact reason that you said people are tired of hearing digital transformation and it goes back. It's more than 10 years because it goes back to think about, you know, the first time that accounting moved to the cloud and we went, you know, so everything is a digital transformation and transformation suggests you, it's a one and done. So what I, what I keep meaning to train myself to do is not say digital transformation anymore <laughs> to call it digital evolution in that it never stops that we are, you know, constantly trying to evolve the company and, Technology and the advancement of software and hardware that's out there and the, and the capabilities are not going to change. So you can't, so people get mad when they think, okay, we're going to do this and then we're done. It's like, well, that's one step and then we're going to have another step. And then as fast mm -hmm. as technology is moving now, we're going to have to do it again. So, um, yeah, so it's, I, so digital evolution is the new, uh, way I'm thinking about it. And, um, the, the, the reason for it is the, if we look back to when I first started my FP&A career, um, you know, everything was in Excel. Maybe, I think maybe we brought in an access database early on and we felt super tech focused then because we, we weren't just doing Excel. We, we had, we had a, a, a database. So, um, but the database, actually, that was sort of my first financial transformation is moving beyond Excel and getting sort of direct access and, and manipulating data in a database instead of uh, mm -hmm. just in spreadsheets. And it's in uh, the technology that's 
come on since then. I mean, every, I, I can't think of a single function um, in accounting and finance and, and on the corporate side that isn't, if not fully automated, made much simpler by just off the shelf software out there right now. I mean, everything from expense management to um, bank reconciliations to full, you know, there's software packages out there now that d- the continuous close. And so if you're not keeping up with the technology, I mean, you're going to get left in the dust. I agree with you. And as I heard someone say, and I really like the way they, f- they phrased it is, you know, AI isn't going to replace finance, you know, right? There's all this talk about chat GP to you, which we'll get to here in a minute. But the way they put it is, you know, fi- finance people aren't going to be replaced by AI. They're going to be replaced by another finance person that's taking advantage of AI. And, you know, it goes beyond just AI. AI sometimes gets used as a term for everything in technology. And it's like, no, there's, you know, there's some lines, but you, it's so true. The technology is getting much better, right? Companies that are not being cutting edge and continuing to evolve, not transform, because like you said, it's an evolutionary process. It's it's constant. There's always something to improve and ways to bring in technology are going to get left behind, in my opinion. I mean, I think we're seeing it rapidly start to change. And speaking to that, you know, ChatGPT came out here a few months ago. And when I reached out to you to the podcast, you were working on a project there around ChatGPT that you recently released. So could you maybe talk a little bit about that, what it, what it was you were doing, a little bit about that project? Sure. And this is um, the project was really meant to be a proof of concept because as I evangelize about what we can do um, with the technology that's out there, I don't, it would be a, a true unicorn to find someone who was a, you know, knew everything you need to about finance and accounting to, to work in or run a finance department and could also <laughs> architect and develop software. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, asking someone to have both of those skills, that that's asking a lot. Um, but I think that what's happening is the technology that's out there is making it easier for p- non, I don't want to say completely non-technical because I think we do have an obligation, whether you're in finance, accounting, sales and marketing, whatever department uh, mm-hmm. or career path you're in, you've got to keep up with the technology. Um, but the the reason for the chat GPT project was I wanted to see if someone with just sort of a base understanding of the underlying uh, technology could use artificial intelligence to um, first off build a tool that would help automate some of the F- FPNA processes, and uh, secondly, get to a way where you could use that tool to interact with your your company's financial data. So the what I did with the project was I took. Um, I created a fictional company and uh, had three years of financial statements just in a in Excel spreadsheets. And uh, my my idea with this was I don't want to, on my own, write a single line of code or even like figure out where I'm going to put this or how I'm going to do it. So it's basically, so if, if someone isn't going to write code, how are you going to get these financial statements moved into a database where you can uh, run some some automation on them? So uh, opened up chat GPT, um, basically outlined with a prompt, the project I wanted to do. And, uh, I did, well, I did tell it, uh, because I'm thinking about the architecture. I said, I want to do it in Google Colab, um, and, uh, use, uh, SQLite databases. And the reason <laughs> I picked those were they're both free and you, for a SQLite database, you can even connect to like, a you know, your, your Microsoft, uh, uh, not Microsoft, your Google Drive and and just put CSVs in there and, and or, or put your, your database in there. So I, I gave it the parameters and said, now what do I do to get this information out of the CSVs and into a database? And through a series of prompts, you see, um, you know, I, I uh, set up the tables, import the data, and then run some basic uh, FP&A on them and do some kind of cool things. And it's really, it's not meant, no one could take the code that, uh, chat GPT and I wrote and, you know, run that in production, but it's in an amazingly few steps where I wrote no code, um, where chat GPT wrote all of it. You can see kind of the future of, of where this is, is going. And there's a little right now it's sort of, I I compare it to like AOL in the uh, dial up era, you know, you're kind of, it's, you're watching the sausage be made. You know, I can remember (laughs) back in the day, the screeching modem while you're waiting to connect. And it's, there's a little (laughs) bit of of that uh, going on. You know, this is not 
for everyone, but it's moving so quickly. I think there's, it's, it's only a matter of time before you're not seeing how the sausage is made. You're giving the prompts and it's doing it all in the background and you're just seeing the finished product. But if you want to be able to capitalize on it, then this was that first shot out there for me to show AI can do all this stuff for you. Um, and it was, it, it was ended up being a fascinating project and, um, I'm, I'm probably, I don't know if I'll do another paper on it, but I'll, I'll probably keep just pushing this and seeing how far I can take it with chat GPT writing code and what kind of stuff we can come up with. Yeah, I really, I enjoyed reading it. You know, I, Glenn sent me the article before that came out and I appreciate that as you're getting ready to post it. And I've read through the whole thing this week, you know, in preparation for us chatting and it was really impressive. You know, I know it was Python, a lot of what it used to write that code, you know, is the language that GP, chat GPT, but I was really impressed. You know, a couple things in there I saw is I know you, uh, you also, you had to do some financial ratios. And then at the end you asked, you created a, a simple bot and asked it some natural language questions. So why was that kind of the path you chose of what you wanted, the tasks you wanted chat GPT to do like the bot and that? Yeah. A great question there. And that's, so <laughs> the, First off, when I started the project, I was envisioning an API with ChatGPT where I would just put all the data into these tables and then have ChatGPT go direct to the tables and answer questions. Now, there may be a, a pro version or whatever, but on the, um, on, on the publicly available version, you couldn't do that. You couldn't just have ChatGPT go look at your databases. But the whole kind of the whole point of the the project for me was to have this automated system that could basically be I don't know, maybe like a junior analyst or whatever. So if the CEO or CRO or anybody else in the company has a question, whether rather than reaching out to uh, FPNA and asking for a report or whatever, how cool would it be? And I actually, I did a project like this, uh, in my book too, using Lex, the, the Amazon, uh, language, but it, it's not as, uh, I had to actually in that load the questions for it to ask. So it would know what to answer. So this is, and I wrote the book two years ago. So in two years, the technology that's out there has gone from, okay, I'm making a chat bot using, uh, the Amazon Lex service to now, uh, you know, on the, on the doorstep of just having chat GPT do this. But th the whole idea is all these, I mean, think about depending on the size of the company and the resources that are out there, uh, when people want reports, depending on, um, how, uh, you know, how backlogged the, uh, the report group is and how, how much the data is democratized, you could have to wait, uh, you know, a day, a week, or, you know, you're stuck in the backlog for some complex report, wait a really long time to get data that's needed, for a business to make these data-driven decisions. So my proof of concept there was, um, can we find a way to automate some of these easier reports? And it's really, it's about data democratization and how, if we've got a, a system that can do this, we're not taking any human resources and can answer these questions. That's to me, the next wave of finance automation. That makes a lot of sense to me, what you said there about, you know, kind of the next wave of finance automation and wanting to demonstrate that, you could create a bot where people could go ask questions, use natural language and get responses versus having to wait from a report department or a more senior finance analyst or whoever it may be. So, you know, question there, how long do you think we're, we are away from having, you know, this in most our tools, getting to that point where you kind of almost have, as you put it, the junior analyst. So I honestly, I think the bones in this project kind of helped prove that in, in, uh, in practice for me, not just theory, but I have been saying, and I've, I've thought about this at least the, the past couple of years, someone, and because I've been in the small and medium enterprise space under 50 million a year in, in uh, revenue. Sure. And, um, in that space, there's not a lot of, uh, you don't have as much data as the big companies do. You don't have uh, mm -hmm. as many resources as the big companies do. Um, and I think that we're on the verge of something like when QuickBooks came out. I mean, it revolution in QuickBooks desktop and then QuickBooks online, it revolutionized yep. accounting for small businesses. Now, if you're at, at one of these large companies right now that has access to an incredible amount of data and uh, teams that can work with it, you can do some amazing things with FPNA and looking at, uh, you know, whether you're forecasting or uh, trying to explain 
budget variances or whatever. You just have so much more data to work with. I think someone is going to come along and have a product that is basically the QuickBooks of, uh, of uh, machine learning that brings this capability uh, to the small businesses that could otherwise couldn't have it. And I think that there's probably a way that you, once you had enough customers, you could actually, that whoever came up with this software could aggregate data and they could anonymize it and, and all that, but be able to use a broader data set than any single small business would have. Um, and yep. I really think this is going to be a next wave. And so is to answer your question, I think the base technology is there right now, and there's so many people doing so many things with this, uh, the large language models and all the ad advances that are going on right now. That's just on the chat side, but just in, in you know, there's tools out there to, to do drag and drop ML. And, and if you combine all these, um, it just takes someone that's going to have, have the focus on doing it for FPNA. And it's, as soon as someone finds that, I think there's going to be an off the shelf product that is uh that offers this today and i've seen and I, i'm not gonna you know come on and shill for any particular software but there are components of this in SaaS products that are out there right now um mm -hmm. and it's only and it's only gonna it's it's, it's a an arms race you know right now so there's e between existing products and some startup that's really gonna nail it i, I mean it, as soon as someone gets the focus on this we're gonna start seeing this on the market no, I, I totally agree. And I've even seen a few, you know, very small companies that have Im implemented chat GPT and some of the things they're doing. So I, I a hundred percent agree with you. We're seeing it and they're going to, someone's going to figure out how to package that. And, you know, it's going to change. It's going to be in many ways, a game changer around many of those basic tasks that for companies, especially when your date, if your data is fairly structured and clean, I mean, it's amazing what you, the answers you can get out of it. And it's, I think it's an extra incentive to keep that data clean. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Because you get really messy data and, think, and you don't have good master data and it gets really hard, regardless of whether it's AI or a human trying to make good sense of the data. Oh, yeah. And like, you know, 80% of data science is just cleaning the data, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 60% uh, yeah. of FPNA is cleaning data. If you're yeah, an analyst, yeah. you spend a lot of time cleaning data. I mean, I worked at a job where. I had to do almost all kinds of things in Excel and it was just, uh, you know, doing something like this. I was, as I was looking at your project, I'm like, man, I could have done this all without having to know Python using, you know, the scripts and versus power query and a lot of those type of things. So it, you know, it's exciting to see where the technology is going. You know what it is like 13 different spreadsheets emailed out to 23 different budget holders multiple iterations, version control, errors, back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop, breathe. DataRails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. DataRails takes data from all of your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex, consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow, FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up to date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean FPNA machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. If someone was to read your project, what do you hope they take away from it? Like, what do you, you know, want them to, what's the one thing you want them to walk away with from the project? Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, you know, you, you and I are geeks like this. So you, you said the, <laughs> the paper was interesting yeah. and I was fascinated by it. Um, for the project as it stands right now, it is, again, it's a, a lot of looking at how the sausage is made. Yep. And so there's, you know, there's big code blocks in there. So it's, it's 30 mm -hmm. pages long, but a lot of that is just the code that chat GPT yep. generated. Um, but I think yeah, I will admit also, I didn't read all I didn't read the code. I skipped those parts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
So the takeaway for readers of it is if you can endure that, and honestly, the audience we're talking to, this isn't like a broad, uh, we're just talking to anyone who's doing accounting and finance. We're talking to our kind of geeks right here. We're talking to FBNA people who like to get down into the weeds and, you know, do all this stuff. So hopefully, uh, you know, some of your listeners, listeners would find it interesting as well. And, and also because of the nature of our job and what's out there, uh, you know, there's, a lot of your audience will be better coders than I would ever be and just kind of understand the fundamentals of this. But I guess what this, like I can write a SQL query. It takes so ridiculously long to do it. And it's, that's the worst use of my time is to actually be sitting in front of a blinking cursor trying to do that. And I, I guess the thing that I want people to take away from this is whether it's I've written a SQL query it's for some reason it's not working. I can dump that into chat GPT and it'll QA it and find out where you left the comma out and, you know, save so much time over what we were doing. But w- what I really was amazed at, um, and it took me several weeks to do the paper, but primarily because chat GPT was crashing all the time because of such high use. <laughs> so I'd have to wait yeah, for chat usage, GPT to yeah. come up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, what I hope someone would take away from it is that, I didn't write a single line of code for that, which means they wouldn't have to. So it's all about sort of prompt engineering and chat GPT and then seeing going from having these three CSVs of financial statements to a a chat bot at the end that you could ask specific questions of without writing a single line of code. I mean, that to me is amazing and it shows the potential of the future. And I hope it gets people excited about what's what's out there. Yeah. And I, and I definitely think it will. And, you know, along those lines, in my last Excel training I did, I brought in chat GPT and, you know, had it write a number of formulas and showed people, look, it's another resource you can use in addition to Google and addition to Microsoft's help. You just need to be, you know, careful and audit it. Make sure that what it's giving you is right. Cause I showed, Hey, you know, in these cases, the formulas had some issues and here's why. And, you know, is that really good reminder that y- you can use it. You can use it today. There are areas that can help you in your job but don't just blindly trust it. That is a great, I'm so glad you brought that up. So in, uh, in the, in, in these generative models, they call the, uh, when, I mean, chat GPT will give you, no matter what it's answering, it will give you with such certainty. This is the, <laughs> the base reality. This is the truth of everything. And they call, I, I, mm-hmm. I heard this the other day, they call those hallucinations. So it's when, <laughs> when this predictive text model gets it wrong, it's just, it's hallucinating something. And there's, you've seen all the people go out and, uh, you know, hack the prompts and get, uh, get chat GPT to have an existential crisis. It's, it's amazing what's going on. So that is such a key point with it and whether you're using it to write content or if you're a middle school kid trying to use it to play your to write a paper for you it's it's just <laughs> generative text it's not sentient and when it writes the code as well it's kind of like the, these drag and drop machine learning tools like there there are things out there that it's amazing you can bring your data in tell it what you're trying to predict on and it'll go do some kind of uh, you know random forest and and come up with these predictions um, but if you don't know what a random forest is or how it works or what model would actually be the best to use, then it doesn't, it, it's, you're, <laughs> you're putting yourself at risk and you're going to, you know, mm-hmm. confidently report on, on something that is, is dead wrong. So that's, that is a key point And you've actually crystallized it better than I did in that it is a tool that's out there to help you. Um, but like in that, paper, if something were wrong, if you were just relying on chat GPT to do queries and you didn't have a base understanding of it, it could be querying the wrong thing. You're putting together a board, of, uh, you know, a, a report for your board of directors or whatever. It's, it's just like you wouldn't turn over, uh, if you're writing text messages, if you've ever done that, where you just completely turn it over to the predictive text to respond and you just sort of follow <laughs> the trail of what, I mean, that, that, that would be the same thing. And we're not there yet yeah. at all. It, uh, with letting, yeah, you I've know, got myself in trouble more than once, not <laughs> noticing the autocorrect change the word. And I'm like, Ooh, did I just say yeah. that in the text? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So data robot or, uh, sorry, chat GPT is, um, a great, uh, tool to have out there, um, as long as you know what you're doing and it's, it's a human machine collaboration and it's like a really cool financial calculator or, or knowing R or something. It's just another really cool tool in your tool belt. Th- that's a really cool way to think of it. Kind of like that financial calculator. When we first got the PC, how much did it simplify our work? I think chat GPT is a lot like that. Or when we first got a spreadsheet, as you mentioned, QuickBooks, what, what are those, those moments that have kind of uh, revolutionized the way we work, right? 
getting a calculator revolutionized it, going to a computer, all of a sudden having a spreadsheet, you know, QuickBooks on the accounting side. And now, you know, for finance and other industries, chat GPT and AI in general is going to have ways that it can help revolutionize the way we work if we're, you know, and so it's important, like you said, to understand enough to be able to use it. You don't need to be a tech geek. You don't need to write code. You know, I've always been a big fan of people learning basic SQL, learning Excel well. You know, I came from a little of a data background because I did report writing for a while and it's you know served me a lot of value. So people need to understand it, but you don't need to be a tech geek. And I think there's a clear difference between the two. Absolutely, yeah. And it's getting, and the, the really cool thing is that chasm is getting narrowed more and more by how quickly and and how uh, how far beyond where it started the technology is going so i yeah go back to your earlier question i mean we're we're there now we just need somebody some uh uh if you have any young entrepreneurs in your <laughs> your group looking for a, a, a startup uh i really think that uh, building a tool that focuses on this that the base technology is there it's just applying it to what we do great so the kind of question we've talked quite a bit about technology here and I have one more question along those fronts. So, you know, think out five, 10 years. How do you see the FP&A departments different from today? And, you know, maybe how do you see, you know, and beyond just chat GPT, but technology in general shaping kind of FP&A and finance? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's a couple of different ways to go on where the, the technology is. And I think the the two things that I want to look at that I would say are going to be vastly improved are um, sort of the whole back office system, the software that's out there, how connected the software is and how data moves from one system to another. Mm -hmm. And once all your different, whether it's a single ERP that's, you know, actually covers everything and all your data lives in that, or if it's multiple systems that are linked together um, and you have sort of this uh, unique identifier that, identifies records and transactions all the way through all these systems and you have more and more data, that's the base that's happening with the data that's available to us. So if you're, maybe your CRM didn't used to speak to your accounting or your project management or your fleet management, whatever your system is that's out there, you have these independent siloed records that are not connected. And so if you're trying to get a true picture of your customers and of the transactions that's going on, it's very difficult. So we've seen over the last decade, certainly, but even even back before that, trying to tie the information from these systems together. So mm-hmm. as the connection between the systems gets uh, more, as they get more integrated and the data becomes uh, more cohesive, whether you're doing a data lake or data warehouse or whatever, or you know whatever you're doing to capture this data, when you can identify it from end to end, um, and you have this much more data, the, the second part of that is the data science component of it. And the more data you have access to from all these systems, then the, mo- the more predictive you're going to be able to get because you're going to have more correlations and more features to build out these models. So right now, if you don't have access to maybe very early customer data of, from the CRM or, or maybe you don't have uh, access to information about when the customer churns and you can't see, so, so building models will get better. And then, you know, the way you build the statistical models and find correlations, the more data you have. And I, I, I briefly touched on this in the paper, like just finding things that are related, you know, does the, how does the cost of sales relate to the, I don't know, oversimplified here, but the cost of sales to inventory levels or to what, you know, whatever it is. But I think the more data you sure. have, the better you can train these models. So the, the two fronts it's going to go on will be the system integration. And I'm seeing more and more now, and we talked about this a little before we went on air, the combination in when people are getting finance degrees or MBAs right now, the combination of analytics with that. So we're going to have mm-hmm. a more trained group of people that is trained more based on machine learning and the what's out there. So it's going to be these two things moving together and FP&A and automation will increase with it too. But the people who are using the automation, everything will be more informed. So we're going to see some pretty significant uh, changes. And then one thing, and uh, one last thing I'll say about that is I, I think back to the beginning of my finance career, the amount of data entry that went on and sort of the mindless work that we had to do. And it's, if you're entry level, finance person, you're doing a boatload of data entry. And Mm -hmm. I think as this automation increases, 
that mindless work goes away. And the real value that we give to the organization is this mindful work that we do. And we spend less time, like you said, 60% of FBNA is data cleaning. Well, we spend less time on that and we're adding a re- real value and, you know, hopefully keep showing more and more how, how we can drop that uh, cost center moniker that we get stuck with a lot and say, no, we're, here's how we're providing real value to the company. Yeah. Th- th- that's exciting times. Cause that's where every, you know, finance person wants to be is really, you know, in those strategic discussions, being viewed as a value creator, having that seat at the table versus, all right, well, I got Delta Air and Delta Airlines over here. Are they the same customer? And how do I make it all work, right? You know, we've all been there, whatever the analogy is, Ford and Ford Inc., right? I could name any big company and you could probably have four different ways. If four only, you're probably doing pretty good. Four or more ways that it's spelled between your different systems. And it's like, how do I get this all to... End to end, as you talk about, really understanding that full life cycle of your customer and what that brings. And so I think you brought a lot of great points there. So I know, you know, you've been a CFO of a number of different companies. So kind of question there as far as a CFO, when you're looking for somebody in FPA, you're looking to hire somebody or bring someone in to help with that budgeting and forecasting, what skill sets do you look for today in somebody? I mean, it it is so much more the analytics now. And I um you know, obviously, the importance of understanding the the, the fundamentals of finance they they have to have that too. But what I guess going back to what I just said is, I'm seeing more and more uh, the the finance comes with the analytics as well. Um, but whether whether or not you're officially, you know, even if even if someone I'm talking to, if Excel was the only tool they used, but they get the the difference between. Uh, you know, linear regression and polynomial regression, it's just the understanding of, of the basic math of it. Um, and actually a solid, and this, when I started, I didn't realize this when I started in finance, but an understanding of statistics is so key to me because I will say, and I guess the, all the people I've hired have had a finance background, but if you took a statistician and, you know, gave them the basics of what we're looking for here and whether, you know, in the, um, income statement or whatever, um, and had them apply their statistical knowledge to finance. I mean, to, the, to them, it, 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 the number is the number. And, and to get them started, I, I'd say a really good statistician could learn the finance side, just like a, a really, if, if you're a finance person, you could learn the statistics side as you go. But I think um, just that having that uh, analytical and um, mathematical mindset is, is really the key part of it. And if someone has that and that foundation, you can almost teach the rest. It's like the Southwest airlines when they hire, you know, they're hiring for a certain personality type and an understanding. Um, if you, but if you have that foundation, I think you can train on the rest. Agree with the idea of, you know, foundation, whatever that foundation is, you're looking for an employee, you can train the rest. You want to get those basics. And I think we talk about statistics, I do think there's an opportunity for finance to use that a lot more, and we're starting to see it. In fact, this week I was working on an article that I was writing around Monte Carlo simulation. And, you know, so, right, that's something that isn't used enough. I haven't used that in my career. I learned it in school. And then you get in and it's like, yeah. oh, you do some simple weighted probabilities. And it's like, right, well, why should I wait three scenarios when if I have the right tools, I can look at 10,000 different scenarios and get an expected probability and a lot more information to reduce risk and increase accuracy. Yes. Right? Because that's really what it's about is you're trying to make sure you're best deploying that next dollar of capital and managing the risk. Because the risk is going to be there regardless, whether you use Monte Carlo, statistical, or just scenarios, or however you build the model. It's really helping you to manage the risk and to be more accurate. At least that's kind of how I think of bringing in you know statistical modeling into finance. Would you agree? Is that how you kind of see it? Absolutely. And I love that you said that because that was actually, I took CS50, uh, the, the Harvard computer science, the David Mallon's uh, course that's, you know, it's on edX and all the free platforms out there now. It's probably the most popular, uh, it's the most popular undergrad course at Harvard. And I think one of the most popular uh, online courses, but my final project for that was a Monte Carlo simulation for <laughs> FPNA. And, it was, and it's, and, and, and I loved it. It is amazing. So yeah, instead of doing just your, you know, worst case, mid and best case, I mean, we're going to do 10,000 of these and, and see what comes up. And it's, it's pretty, uh, 
pretty amazing out there. And I, I think having that statistical understanding opens up all these new tools that are out there that, uh, uh, that you can use to improve forecasting. I agree. Well, I could probably talk all day on the tech stuff with you, but I'm not sure our audience wants me to go that yeah. long. So we're going to move into some of our more standard questions here. I have about four or five questions for you and then we'll let you go. So first one, this is one we ask everybody, you know, I've always been a big believer that failure as the world classifies, it leads to success, that, you know, failure is a learning opportunity. So can you describe a time you've had a, experienced a failure at work? What did you learn from the failure? Actually, I love this question because my biggest uh, corporate failure was, is kind of my origin story. A um, million years ago when I was in telecom, <laughs> I was the, the budget director um, and I had, uh, I was managing a $150 million budget and it was me and my procurement guy. And that was it. And we worked like crazy. And, uh, it was just, it was a lot to, uh, a, a lot to do and, uh, and just no resources to do it. And my procurement guy was great. And he, uh, knew more about, you know, he knew more about pro the procurement process and all, all that than I would probably ever know, but he was, very, very old school. And when I say old school, this man kept everything on a paper ledger. He, he had a, those big CRT monitors. He had one of those on his desk. It, it never even turned on. He was, he had just piles and piles of paper around his, his, his cube. And, um, I've worked with in this. Yeah. <laughs> so in this era, um, in this, everything was siloed. Our controller did not, when I was on the, on the op side, our controller did not want to give us any access to a system. If we wanted something from him, we'd ask for a report. Someone on his team would get a report to us. It might take 24 hours. It might take two weeks. Um, so we had no real-time visibility into uh, data. And we were coming up at the end of the year. Um, I think our CapEx budget was like $17 million, well, $15, 17000000 million in there. And we didn't, you know, <laughs> my, uh, my procurement guy, tracked all the invoices in his paper ledger and we're coming up towards the end of the year. We were a uh, VC backed company. We had board meetings come up. We were, you know, really tough times for telecom in the, uh, in the early two thousands. And we knew this yes. board meeting was going to be contentious and um, we're coming up towards the end of the year, trying to just really laser in on the budget and on say, a, say a $15 million budget in, November, where there's no time to do anything, we find uh, there was one extra invoice from uh, one of our suppliers that we'd lost track of. It was only $1.5 million and it had been paid. So the, the, the finances of it were fine. But when 10% of your budget is off by one invoice that you didn't have any visibility into, it was... I mean, it was this ruined my Thanksgiving that year. Me, the CTO, and a bunch of other people worked like... <laughs> all the way through Thanksgiving weekend, trying to figure out how, how are we going to save face with our, um, with the event we're about to get killed. We were sure we were all going to be fired. And, uh, I was ready to go teach high school by the end of the weekend. I was like, well, my finance career is done. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go, uh, just do something different, but we got through it and we, you know, had a really painful board meeting that we, we had to get through with all that. And it was such a disaster that I, once I came out the other side of it, I realized I'm never going to operate where I don't have full visibility into all the financials and the ability to see all this again. And I'm nothing is ever happening on paper. We're going to have a slug trail for everything that we do. And we're <laughs> anyway, it was it was the most painful part of my career. But it really and this would have been, I don't know, 2000, 2004 or so, probably. But it really changed the uh, trajectory of my career. And I got the support from some senior management at the time. And I actually, from that, got to build the company's first business intelligence team. I had, uh, you know, back in the day, crystal report writers and everything that came out and we took over the, <laughs> the, the metrics for the whole company. And it really, from then the, t the things I got out of it were visibility, data democratization, and, um, being able to, <laughs> uh, see things from end to end. And, uh, that's also where I got my idea that finance, and this is a whole other conversation, so we'll save that for another day, but that finance needs to be the owner of all the KPIs for the company, not just the financial metrics. So, yeah, we'll save that one given where we're at for another day, but I tend to agree that there's a lot of benefit when you have cross-functional metrics to have them all sit in finance as kind of that 
that owner of them. So I definitely think there's some value there. And I, you brought back some memories when you said crystal reports. So I, I remember that <laughs> system as well, but you know, it sounds like it really helped you on your path and helped define your career. So it was a defining moment that you ended up lo- learning a ton from, but I'm sure not fun in the moment. So that no, I appreciate horrible. you sharing <laughs> that example. Yeah. Not fun at all in the moment. I, I can relate to some of those type of things. So, you know, I think you've talked a little bit about probably kind of the biggest opportunity for FP&A moving forward with the way technology is going. What do you see as the biggest challenge for FP&A moving forward? I mean, I do. I think it is. And it's not just for FP&A. It's for all fields. We have to, we become specialists and experts in a field, whether it's law, marketing, whatever, you know, (laughs) finance, you become an expert in that. And then because technology is being deployed so much out there right now, the challenge is now we have to become experts or at least have a very sound working knowledge of something that's different than what we do every day. But if we don't keep up with that technology, if you don't kind of get on board and ride the wave of this AI and machine learning and all all the uh, transformation that's going on technologically, you're going to get drowned by the wave rather than (laughs) move forward on it. So I think the challenge is going to be, how do I keep up with whatever the latest, uh, you know, accounting rules are on treatment of leases versus, and at the same time, keep up with whatever the latest technology is that's out there. And it's, um, I, I, I wish there were an easier way to do it, but I, uh, I'm, I'm climbing to the top of the mountaintop and just preaching to anyone who will listen, you can't ignore this. You have to embrace it dive deep. And um, does that mean maybe you need to go on, uh, if you haven't already, go on Coursera and take a a, a SQL course? Yeah, sorry. It probably does. <laughs> but fp a guys, we, we all know that. I mean, I think I, I am preaching to the choir here, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hear you. So it sounds like, you know, that biggest challenge is just being prepared and riding the wave versus being swallowed by the wave of yeah. what's coming. And yeah. I, I tend to agree with you knowing the basics of SQL. I've always preached that fp a should at least know the basics. You don't need to be hard code and be able to write big detailed SQL, but be able to understand it well enough that if you need to pull something or review what ChatGPT wrote for you to pull something, being able to do that. So I, I think you and I are on the same page there. I've had that discussion with a number of FP&A people and get different answers. So the next question, this is where we get kind of to the personal question of our interview. What is something unique about you that you can share with our audience? Something we wouldn't find online. I wrote and produced an independent film <laughs> in 2007. It's called The Hanged Man. It's horrible. Like, no, nah, I don't know. That's not fair. I don't, well, I don't. <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> You're not giving it, it, it a reading film, endorsement. If I yeah, see this yeah, on, no, I, on Rotten Tomatoes, I'm probably not watching it. It's horrible. Well, yeah. <laughs> so I'll say this. For a first-time filmmaker who went from <laughs> nothing to completed film that was distributed and out there on Netflix for a while, and I think you can still get the DVD somewhere. I don't; it's not streaming anymore. So, you know, for a student film, it would have been pretty good. But uh, it was, uh, I don't, it, um, yeah. So it's it's called The Hangman. It's um, about some social misfits who uh, uh, are are drawn in by this uh, cult-like leader to uh, um, to a barn in the middle of nowhere and and hijinks happen. And that, <laughs> so that's way <laughs> off the beaten path for probably uh, most FPNA folks to, to have done that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I can't say that's what I expected. So I appreciate yeah. that. That's the first we've had. So I, I like yeah. that. So now this is one of my favorite questions I ask everybody. You know, our sponsor Data Rails is a platform built on Excel. So your favorite Excel formula, feature, kind of function, what's your favorite thing about Excel? I, <laughs> I, the the probably the one I uh, these are so I'm going I'm trying I'm kind of running through the laundry r- list right now thinking about ooh index <laughs> match is cool or, um and really for me though it's probably <laughs> the closest because I use it so much is just when you don't have that unique identifier or, or when you are trying to combine data from different sources the the thing I use in Excel. Well, now I'm, now I'm thinking pivot tables. Okay, I'm just going to say VLOOKUP, which was my initial answer I was going to say, because I'm, <laughs> you're taking so much information from different tables and trying to match those and bring them together for the uh, people who can't do that. I, that's probably the, the one that I use the most. It's not the sexiest, um, but it is, it's, I'm using it daily, you know. 
It's good old faithful and lots of people use it. I totally get it. Yeah. A good lookup, whether it's VLOOKUP, index match, lookup, yeah. X lookup, as long as you power query, whatever. There's plenty of ways yeah. to do a lookup, but it's one of the most valuable things in Excel is to know how to do it. Yeah. So I can totally understand that one. So next question here, what advice would you offer to someone starting a career in fp a today? So if you could give them one piece of advice, what would it be? Yeah. So I think, uh, and, and we touched on this earlier, and I think the technology is going to change. So having a, a technology angle is good. But going back to what I said earlier, a, a good knowledge of statistics is going to go a long way. So beyond just the, the finance and accounting, and that's probably part of most finance curriculum right mm-hmm. now, but I, I think pay a lot of a, a attention to it and really think about applying that and building statistical models. And because then it's no matter what the technology is, and if you're going into more of a data science angle with it, having that just sort of basic statistics understanding will dictate what machine learning algorithm you're going to use or how you approach a problem or how you look for features to put the model in correlations and and ways to really hone the model. And it would really be take statistics seriously. And if you've got some electives, maybe spend spend them on a couple more of, um, of statistics. Great. I think that, you know, I think you're the first one that's given us the statistics answer. So I like it. We, I like to get different answers. And I've really enjoyed the time with you here. You know, last question, if somebody wants to be able to get a hold of you, if they'd like to, you know, reach out, what's the best way for them to contact you? I think LinkedIn is probably the best. It's really the only social media I'm active on at all. And, uh, um, it, yes, I think LinkedIn is probably the best way to get me. Okay. And then if anyone wants to, uh, you know, maybe read your book or see your chat GPT, we'll put those in the notes so people can access that. And, you know, again, just wanted to thank you for being on the show. We've really enjoyed having you. I know I've enjoyed chatting with you and I think our audience will really enjoy this episode. So thank you for your time, Glenn. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate it. 